Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trails Guru. What an episode. We've got someone who's a client of myself and Chris, and then Chris is going to show up fashionably late to this podcast, but um, we have a special guest because it's one of our clients of DSCS. It's a SOS attendee, like enthusiast, Abraham Arzola. He is the founder and site director at El Paso Clinical Trials, which he's been running since January of 2022. And he just graduated from the University of Texas, El Paso, UTEP, in May of 2020. So, I mean, this is someone who started a site almost fresh out of college. (laughs) And you're such an inspiration to so many people, man. Like, you know, I got thrown into it by accident after college, yeah. but it's because my dad, you know, had the hookup. He's like, I wanted to go to med school. And he said, hey, come intern at this site that I'm one of like five doctors. Yeah. Because that's the only way you're getting in med school with your grades. <laughs> we do research. I was like, OK. And then two months in, everyone started leaving. The business manager was stealing. Oh, man. My dad said, hey, you need to go get a real job or, like, take over if you want because no one wants this. It's liability. (laughs) And you have to put your own money into it now because payroll, nobody made payroll. Then please quit. Oh, man. And I'm like, okay, let's, like, (laughs) I guess I'll do it. We had two existing studies, and they had me. I didn't do nothing. They had me just buy dry ice and McDonald's for patients. <laughs> like that's the extent of my knowledge of research. So yeah. that's how I got started early. But you, I want to know how you got started so early. Yeah, I know. Because so primarily the way it worked out is in undergrad, like you know, at UTEP, the University of Texas at El Paso, I was heavily involved in academic research. You know, I was on a research scholarship. I was in a, you know, a neuroscience lab there. And Day in and day out, we would focus on, you know, neuroscience, just academic side of research. So, you know, the basic sciences, you know, more bench work and stuff like that. And, you know, our focus was Alzheimer's disease and and other dementias and trying to correlate, you know, specific animal model to see if it could lead to discoveries in human humans. But again, we were on the basic side of things. And so, but I've always loved research. I've always loved the technical aspect, the science, the, you know, the discovery aspect of it all. And then, you know, I had a, you know, my time at the NIH, National Institutes of Health, that's when I really got, you know, more exposure to the clinical research aspect of it. You know, I saw teams of, and again, I wasn't at the NIH, I wasn't involved in the clinical research side of it. I was both, you know, looking at, um, (laughs) well, really just looking at teams of physicians and coordinators running around the place and, and trying to handle patients and talking, you know, you know, jargon filled, you know, scientific discoveries. And, and really at their goals were to not only like better understand disease states, but also inter, you know, incorporating new like therapeutic methods to see if they could discover stuff. And so that's really when I got my first look at clinical research and, and I was just like, wow, like that's not an El Paso, you know what I mean? Like we have nothing like that there or at least so nothing. So you're an entrepreneur. So first of all, shout out to AMCs. I know I'd like bash them a lot on this channel. That's not the intent. Yeah. This is an example of it doing its purpose, like helping a student open his eyes yeah. to research. And then it was the right kind of student because you're, I mean, there's no way you're doing that and thinking, why is there no site in El Paso without having entrepreneur blood in you? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Like, I don't know why. I, and again, like, it was really just like seeing that and just saying, like, why don't we have that here? You know what I mean? And, and so after after my time at the NIH, you know, I was here back in El Paso. And again, obviously after the pandemic and everything. And so I was like, well, how can we get this started? You know, like, how can we actually do clinical research on a, you know, more patient oriented scale? And again, that's always like what we all use is that focus of patient orientation. That's what, where it has to be, right? Because at the end of the day, patients are you and me and we could be in studies, you know what I mean? And so we I always think of it like if my family member was joining a study, like how would I want them to be treated? You know what right. I mean? And so that's kind of like our ethos, our, our, you know, our values. And, and so, you know, so that's when, you know, I contacted you guys and I was like, Hey, what's the realistic, what's the feasibility of actually doing a clinical research and getting Wait, a study? So you contacted and shout out to Chris for waking up early for this. Chris, <laughs> round of applause. Mr. Abraham, how's it going? Hey, hey Chris, Chris amazing. Good that you're joining us you're special abraham chris doesn't join early podcasts for anyone <laughs> that's right thanks chris thanks. Uh, 
so you thought to hire me and Chris, an archive, shameless plug, DSC, so we help sites get studies, do their budgets, all kind of stuff. Uh, before you had like a PI or anything in mind, you just called us exploratory call? Well, before I even called you, like I was doing my back end research of like clinical research, right? You you do Google, you Google search clinical research, how, and then you see all the like a CRO sponsors, and you're like, okay, how to start a CRO. And then it's like, oh, well, CRO is really big. You would want to start out at a site level. And of course, anytime you look up how to, you know, make a clinical research site, the, you know, the Guru Nation pops up as the first click. And so yes. I was like, oh, okay. So I clicked the link and I don't know, like, and again, I first thought of this in December. And so like, of 2021 and yeah like a whole month of just watching your videos really doing some deep end research looking at your three hour you know guidelines of like okay this is the first step here's your next step this is what you do and I was like okay that's great information you know and so I said okay well let me talk to some you know physicians I know and and just kind of go around in the area because and again you even said it like not every physician wants to do clinical research okay. which is exactly the case like some you'll call their office and they say Clinical research, no, no, immediately no. And it's just like, oh, like would you would they want to know what like more information? And it's like, no, 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 thank you. And I'm pretty sure that's because physicians get burned either by the medical school here or by Texas Tech here in El Paso, based right. with their contributions, you know. <laughs> and so they, they have like a bad perspective. And so thankfully we did find a physician who was interested and willing to, you know, work with us. Cause again, like I really didn't have that experience. How did you know yet. that one? How did you find that one? It was really through one of my friends, you know, one of my friends, he, he was the, basically the clinic manager for the physician. Ah, and okay. he was able to say like, Hey, you know, he's worth giving a shot, you know, cause he, this knew is me where personally. I talk like your sphere of influence guys, your sphere of influence is powerful. Yeah. Like there's no magic way. Let's run ads until a doctor responds. Okay. That could work, but what's more likely to work, is your sphere of influence tap into them your network yeah, yeah. exactly and, and and so thankfully it wasn't you know it wasn't really too long of a process to find that initial physician right and from there once he was like yep yeah, let's do it let's go ahead and and do whatever it takes to start clinical research and get studies i was like okay and that's when i reached out to you guys and you know our our introductory meet you know phone call and, and talk it was just like this sounds exactly like what I need, right? Because you guys have all the years of experience and I, I just need, again, I'm in the absorbing phase. Even to this day, I still need just learning, absorbing as much as I can so I can execute it effectively on our site's behalf, right? And so that's where you guys have been beyond phenomenal. Like like that every time you have a, somebody, a guest that uses DSCS on your guys' podcast and, and discussions, like they're not lying, <laughs> you know? Like you guys help us immensely, not only finding studies, right? Because our first, first study was, with your guys's help but also making sure we get a fair budget right and that's primarily chris right there on the budget side Our like chris a budget master <laughs> yeah this like dude sipping that coffee like he knows it too that yeah. wasn't the reason i'm still trying to wake up but uh, yeah. okay i'll take it <laughs> yeah no like chris like any questions i have chris and he's hey, quick Bram, about i it. haven't touched a budget in like 10 years like, <laughs> yeah. i don't even yeah. know what they are i'm like if you, chris likes it it's good yeah <laughs> nice you see like I, I still try to you know look around and and see what you know um <laughs> industry standards are for certain prices and and kind of getting a better head of myself but now nah, chris has been awesome like and then he'll talk to me he's like hey you know truly fair is this number but you know it's gonna be hard to get this like what what are you willing to work with and and that's just awesome because he's so communicative and responsive and, and he knows what he's doing so it's been awesome <laughs> for Dang, the most part man. you know so Abraham, the glad you first, like it. Abraham, glad you're happy. <laughs> Dude, so many people are happy. Like Chris, the the negotiating of the budgets. I mean, I don't like that aspect. I never did. I like <laughs> yeah. to build. I like to train staff. I like to get studies. I like to recruit doctors. I like to recruit patients. Even I even like to do like QA to make sure things are going smooth for a little bit. Yeah. Budgets is like my least favorite thing. When I see those Excels and yeah. those Word, like with all this legal stuff, I mean, I know how to do it, but yeah. I'd much rather Chris do it the right way. Uh, and that's what all of our clients get too. But the the first PI, so did you actually end up partnering with them or uh, was it a contractor? No, it's still, it, it was a contractor and, and it still is to this day, you know, because um, they're still like making sure this is something that's 
actually going to blossom into something that's really worth everyone's time, you know? And so have they expressed interest and like, Hey man, uh, yeah, actually like they, again, like, it's not like, Hey, let me be a partner now. You know, it's, it's more like, Hey, you know, our plans, like this could be something really good. Like maybe we could even think about buying land in the future and building our own research facility. And it's like, you know, and obviously that's more of a partnership, you know, perspective. And so, so, but again, we have to work towards that to really make it successful in the meantime. So our future is secured, you know? So, yeah. Was it a younger guy or? Uh, not, not, not really, not like fresh out of, you know, residency or internship, you know, he's, he's been in the game for middle age. I would say he's been in the game for, for a minute, you know, and, and he's, he has his own clinical practices, you know what I mean? Like he's not associated or I guess he doesn't work primarily for some hospital or some, you know, medical center. He's, he's a standalone, you know, site physician. Perfect. Perfect one. Ours is slightly different at YCT. Uh, they're all in their sixties. Um, mid 60s so nearing retirement age which could be good or bad and at chris i actually talked to the main one yesterday mm-hmm. internal medicine and i asked him you know what are his thoughts and he said as he gets closer to retirement he'll have more time for research wow so That's when it nice. comes to like selling because we have to because of retirement age it's not the case it's it might actually table. be an asset yeah to have him nearing retirement because sure. he has the other providers working underneath him that will still funnel the patients in gives him a reason to come to his site and just check on everything. And but he's not yeah. obligated. To, he's not seeing patients. Yeah. yeah so good. all you VCs trying to negotiate, play bully ball. It ain't going to work. I'll tell you right now in 2024, that ain't working. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you're Abraham. It gets so much easier as you get older, man. Like you're in your twenties. <laughs> I remember those days. I didn't know a thing. We didn't have videos. We had center watch. We had to learn from like <laughs> monitors. The yeah. nice ones. Do you, I don't think they're around anymore, right? Center watch. They're center gone. watch. They're around. They're bought by some IRB or something. <laughs> okay. What are you familiar with? Like how to be safe. Yeah. Are you are you familiar with center watch, Abraham? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually, oh, yeah. I've seen the pop up around, but you know, definitely in that worth our primary research. You know, so. They used to sell. They used to regurgitate GCP or FDA regulations in a book for like 300 bucks. Yeah. Thick <laughs> book though. It was like this thick. Oh, impressive <laughs> as hell. If you don't know what you're doing, you're scared as shit. Like I need to read this thing, but yeah, <laughs> no, you don't. Like yeah, I think the really. videos, this why we decided to do the videos too, but it gets easier. Like, um, uh, doctors in the future, like as you branch out to specialists, it gets easier with age for you because and the more you do it you know they can smell it like right away okay this guy knows what he's doing because i remember when i started that wasn't the case but today (laughs) it's like like within minutes they're like okay let's do it and if they ever try to like counter with like like yesterday one guy tried to counter with more i'm like i can go this much more but anything more than that's not worth it i'm sorry and he's like okay no no it's it's okay yeah. <laughs> so it gets easier. You get the upper hand um, at some point. Um, so how long did it take to the first study you got? Like, was it a good one? Most people's first study is not very good. Ours was actually pretty good. You know, it wasn't, I mean, there was a lot of logistics to figure out on the back end for us. Um, but for the most part, it was actually a really nice introduction to research in general for both me and the PI, right? It wasn't too complicated. It wasn't that much of a headache to like, hey, we have this AE that we have to fix or or understand and and report. You know, it was for the most part, it was really straightforward for us. And so it wasn't it was our first study was a great experience, you know. So I know it's not always gonna go that way, but um, you know, thankfully it helped me learn very quickly too. Cause again for that first study, I was the coordinator and you know I'm I plan on being the coordinator for many foreseeable studies until we're like too big to do it all right so you're doing it all right now doing it all yeah we have one other coordinator right now that's actually helping with uh, our new study that we just got but yeah for the most part your first employee was that yeah yeah Yeah, when did you hire them like when the process literally like at the end of the first that like they weren't even involved in the first day they've only been hired since february of this year you know so so you did everything chris and i tell people to save if you can do it yourself, do it yourself. If you don't need to lease a space, did you lease a space? 
No, we were working out of the physician's Everything. office. Everything. You follow the blueprint like to the T, <laughs> yeah. Abraham. You built the foundation, <laughs> and you see like the benefits of that now. Like you, For sure, you have cash flow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, thankfully, we're not like running negative, thankfully. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. again, you can't really do that for too long until it starts really hurting, you know? So... So yeah, yeah, we have, you know, we have, uh, as we say, like money in the bank and, and we could definitely start investing in our own future and our own growth. And, and again, like I say, that first study was phenomenal for that. You know what I mean? Like it really helped us out and not only like understanding research, like I said, understanding research, because it's, it's easy to watch a bunch of, you know, your videos and, and kind of be like, yeah, I get, and even read your book. Like I did all the research I could, you know, I read the book, I have the audio book too. I've looked at every video and I did all the training courses I could find, like, online for free of course right mm -hmm. but um yeah once you're actually doing it it's it's a little bit different right like because then you have to really think about how this actually plays into the greater regulations of the fda and how it actually yeah. matters like for the patient safety and so it was like little things like of even including like a little checkbox on our source documents that you know sometimes you can miss that but thankfully the monitors help out and it's like oh you know it was good that was only one document like you could that's a protocol deviation, but you know, you could fix that and not, not reportable. It's a fine, you know? And so figuring all of those things out pretty early on, it like, it kind of gave me a, you know, really good perspective of like, this is how we can go ahead moving forward and do it really well, at least as well as we can, you know, and just keep things good on our behalf, especially when the FDA is, eyes, you know what I mean? Cause yeah. Um, you know, I, I always like the principle of like, even when with Brad's like his FDA, I, like I always like the idea of like, we're always FDA audit ready. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like we're going to have to prepare over the weekend. It's like, they give us a call. We're ready to go. You know, like all of our things are taken care of and as bet. And again, as best as possible. Right. Cause it, nothing's ever perfect, but, but that's, um, that's cause you're doing it right now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the next step, if you want to scale is to build a system to where others are doing it also. But I think because of your, like you're so young and kind of new, it's beneficial to you and your future system that you're doing it all. Yeah. Because, because that's going to give your future hires more respect for you. Like, like ours, I, there's nothing I tell any of our staff to do that. I haven't done at some point, nothing. And if there is something new, cause things change, I do it too. I'm like, let me see what this actually entails. That <laughs> way I know when I'm asking someone to do something, it's not like, um, yeah. irrational. Right. Um, yeah, of course. That this is a really inspiring, I think, for a lot of people. So this first person you hired, um, they just started. I mean, what a month ago? Yeah, just just wow. yeah, just a month ago, like oh, two months, I guess. At this, how did point, that work? But... Like, did you do a Indeed ad, or what did you do? So, so the cool thing with this one is, um, I the way it works is here in you know in El Paso, we have a nonprofit foundation called the MCA or the Medical Centers of Americas. And what they do is, again, they're a nonprofit. So they're really involved in not only helping, you know, new research and, and new ideas or inventions come to market actually, but they also have a, a division where they're also trying to help the community with clinical research in itself. Right. And so trying to, they, they offer like trainings for not only just like people who are interested in becoming CRCs for clinical research, but also for principal investigators. And they do that all for free on their end. You know, like they just offer that because that's their goal is to help boost clinical research in the area. And so early on when we started, like I learned of them and I was like, oh, that's cool. Like maybe we could have, like I'm doing clinical research. I'm trying to start a site. Maybe there's some collaboration we can do with each other. Right. And yeah, they, they've been great. Like they do those training programs and they always send us leads and they, they always send us like, Hey, you know, this individual there, they did our training course and they actually send us a whole list of individuals actually like, of, like they all did their training course and they're all interested in clinical research. And, you know, if, if you want, you could reach out to them and they're, you talk, you discuss on the back end with them and that's what we've kind of done. And, you know, did it's, you filter it's been out a list to get this one person? Yeah. Yeah. Cause again, here in El Paso, you know, it's, it's bilingual, you know, a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, patients are Hispanic. So obviously the, you know, being bilingual was, was critical. And, and I, I chose someone who really had a, a science background because again, like they could have a medical perspective, like as an MA or, or, you know, some type of, you know, medical related field. Right. But it doesn't necessarily mean they'll take the science seriously. You know what I mean? Cause right. at, the, at the end of the day, research, clinical research is science and data collection. Right. And so if they've worked in a lab or have been exposed to academic research, 
at least from my perspective, like they are able to handle the data really properly. You know what I mean? Like they, that data is ultimately the the golden goose that you protect, you know what I mean? So, so, so that's what I kind of sought for is somebody who had a background in, in research and, and yeah, this individual, they have their, you know, their degree in biochemistry and they have that research aspect to them. They even have publications under their name. So that's been great with them too, is like, they know what they're doing. That comes in handy. That comes in handy. Yesterday we, I told you, I went to my pulmonologist, the one that the last PI we found and uh, I already got him two studies and um in like uh like two weeks it's i did not expect it and so i brought two coordinators with me because our sub our sub i couldn't make it for the afternoon so i just picked that random two of our four crcs but i'm glad i picked the right one they were they were the ones with the bachelor's okay and science background and um to the to this pi that actually mattered like to yeah. the other ones, it didn't. But to this one, he actually like was like interviewing them, kind of. Oh, to, really? To vet whether he actually wants to work with us, because I only had like two conversations with this guy <laughs> prior to this meeting, and then I'm like bringing him two studies, like, "Hey, we got to do this." Yeah, yeah, we're He's ready like, to start. <laughs> Wait a minute, one of these is a long term study. I don't know you yet. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you who your staff is, and then they explain. Yeah. Like, thank God it was the ones with the bachelor's degrees. I mean, I think they're all like. Yeah equally good but to him it mattered i can tell like he was impressed by their background uh one more question before i let chris kind of open up because chris got his own set of questions well i don't Uh, know if chris does but go ahead well chris (laughs) is well caffeinated now so he might be Uh, waking up (laughs) do you use like any e-source or tools or anything not not yet you know um it's it's funny thing is uh, with a lot of the you know monitors that have come down and you know they always you know that's one of the documents is like what are you what's your primary you know source documentation and and you know it, it, they, and you check a box either paper electronic or both right and uh, so i always like to pick their brains right that's what i always do is like i'll just try to have a conversation and because they they've been in the industry they they're CRAs because they were probably CRCs back in the day and they've done this a lot. Right. And so I've asked a lot of them um, and by a lot of them, like four. Right. And it's like, Hey, what, what do you think's at least better for, for a starting up site and, and easier in the long run to like really manage and make sure it's, you know, it's compliant and stuff like that. And they're, they're hands down though. It's like all oh, paper, paper source. It's, it's wow. easier because you, you can, you have more control over it. And you know, and I was just like, Oh, okay. Paper source. All right. And that's what we've been doing. So paper and and again with e-source, I mean, there's a lot of costs associated with it, and then there's a lot of different vendors and and you know even at SOS, I, I've talked to like four, three different ones, and I was just like, all right, like you guys offer the same stuff but different prices, but you offer a little bit more, and what are we really looking for? And it's like, is that something that's even feasible, you know, starting up? Like maybe when we have like a bunch of studies concurrently, yeah, it would make sense and and staff to manage that, but you know, with just two coordinators and and it's like one study right now like what, what yeah. can we really focus on you know so at, at the, the conference study, yeah. so at the conference you sided with the paper source side yeah 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 the, <laughs> i was the... just gonna say you should have brought an expert <laughs> witness abraham <laughs> called him called him to the stage yeah that was uh yeah I'll, I'll never get the the picture of you in a wig out of my head chris but <laughs> yeah that was, that was something i'm never gonna live that down but yeah so so paper at least for for the time and again i see the benefit to even e-source in terms of a uh, you know really keeping that trail monitored you know and and, and that's uh, really going to come into play yeah the, the audit trail and, and that's going to be really you know critical when there's like more team members and you want to make sure like who's doing what but you know right now i have like direct oversight over what's being done and making sure it's done properly and if not then there's ways to rectify that with you know according to like alcoa standards and all that so yeah so we have there's benefits to e-source there's benefits to paper i think the benefits to e-source outweigh the cons but in your situation you said you only have one study or maybe a couple right. yeah right now it's just one yeah doesn't make sense if you start getting like five to ten and you start building your systems so here's the yesterday we had a complicated visit Nothing was going right for one of our psych studies. Yeah. Like the tech wasn't working on their end, the vendor, everything like mm-hmm. and the patient was in a hurry. 
she's like, I only have an hour. Like, I can't stay. Yeah. Um, so nothing worked well. The visit was half done. And it's a direct to EDC study. Yeah. But we still use Creo to document notes because I'm not comfortable, like, not having a note. Yeah. The thing is, when I got home, that visit wasn't completed in Creo. It was in the Medrio in the EDC. Yeah. But there was no note or anything explaining the issues going on. So an auditor, like a year from now, if they ever look, they're like, well, why was the visit halfway done? Yeah. So I, I was home, right? And I know the staff was busy. They were at a community outreach event. They were working on making sure the patient's like, okay. Yeah. When I got home, I'm like, hey, why is, wasn't this done? So I log into Creo. I just did it. It took me five minutes. I wrote yeah. like a quick note why it's not done. I couldn't have done that with the ESOR or with the papers. So, so now that kind of raises my curiosity. So I assume you went on EDC to get the data to put into ESORs. I didn't need to because um, I know what needs to be done at that visit and I know what wasn't done and what was. So it was really just the date and an explanation of why certain things weren't done. Right. Okay, so you gave an explanation on why vitals weren't captured in the e source, right. but right. okay, got it. Okay. But my staff is newer, and they were busy, and they thought, okay, since it was, you know, the visits like half done, we put what we needed to do in EDC already. They didn't put a note anywhere, so I I did it. Took me five minutes, but I was at home, and then I took a text picture and sent it to everyone, and said, I know it was a dumb like crazy visit but you still need a document because the one of the C's in Alcoac is contemporaneous so he can't be writing this tomorrow so you need to write this today sorry Abraham uh Dan's got me on a tangent now so (laughs) I I should have been on that East Source stage (laughs) when did when did the FDA flip from EDC will never be the source when did they flip from that I think it was with the risk based monitoring, GCP revisions. They never like two, actually. 2017? Yeah, but they never actually flipped. It's just sponsors got more comfortable with it. So mm-hmm. FDA never, never, uh, what's the word, disallowed it, right? They, FDA it was never always said, allowed. FDA never mandate like you need an EDC. They mm-hmm. just demand a clinical study mm-hmm. report at the end well, of the trial. So. If I recall correctly, um, there was a time when you could not directly enter data in the EDC, right? It had to go through a, some sort of source document. Yeah. But, but that no longer is the case, is what you're saying. That's no longer the case when EDCs become like similar to eSource. But the thing with this particular study, we would have not used Creo because I don't want to just spend money. I don't have to for mm-hmm. that study. And the thing about Creo is you only pay what you use. But I was like, well, there's no place to write notes in here. This is stupid. And the only thing we can do is write a note and upload it somewhere, which is dumb. No one's going to do it. (laughs) Plus, I won't be able to track the CTMS to see how much money we made or what we're still Mm -hmm. owed. So I'm still going to pay for Creo for this thing to document and to track expenses and things like that. So this system you're using for the study... It's it's an all in one, right? It's an e, it's an e source and an EDC where it transfers the data. What the sponsor chose is EDC only. Oh, interesting. They have okay. a, they have a e reg thing. Theoretically, you could upload your source there. Okay. But no one's gonna do that. Our site is trained on Creo. No one writes hand notes mm-hmm. and scan there. I know they're not gonna do that. Like it's hard enough to get them to write it on the Creo, like you saw yesterday. <laughs> So, right. you know, I had to do it, but without Creo, that wouldn't have been done. I would have had to do it, what, today and backdate it? Yeah. And what kind of example are you sending to your staff? Like, no. Well, you don't have to backdate it. Just this occurred yesterday. It's just worse. <laughs> it's worse in my opinion. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. But so, anyways, back from the Creo commercial. Yeah. <laughs> back, back to Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah. So I do have actually something that I'm genuinely curious about. So Abraham, um, well, actually I'm going to start here. Dan, how many feasibility questionnaires would you say you need to fill out to get a site selection visit? I think it depends on your area that you're at, but 
Like in Yuma, it's less than Orange County. Mm-hmm. Let's but, say Orange County, some are, some more kind of some more competitive. competitive. Like seven, seven. Really, attempts. you think it's that many? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Lately, they've just been sending them. I feel like, and then not following up on on them. And you might think mm-hmm. it's like three. See, uh, that's always been my experience. Even two, two or three to get a study. Um, but you think it's more like seven in a very competitive area. From what I recall, from like Costa Mesa days when we were there, it was yeah, it was more. Uh, Okay. Okay. Well, Abraham, have you had any more success since we spoke? And why I'm asking this is because yeah. you oftentimes people don't realize you I mean they really don't that you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. Um, so Abraham and I had a conversation not too long ago about something he was doing that probably was affecting his ability to get studies. And I was just curious if you had any more opportunity to implement uh what we discussed um well since since we last talked you know regarding some of the feasibilities and and right it's just been my experience recently that a lot of the times uh at least re- and actually i guess throughout this whole uh, process is that a lot of the sponsors take a lot of time to kind of get back to you regarding a lot of the steps right and so right now we've only filled out one feasibility like additional since. this this yeah since and um you know, we've signed CDAs, we reviewed protocols, and we're just waiting for getting those feasibility questionnaires. You know what I mean? And so, yep. so and and that's it's kind of crazy sometimes. It's like we'll sign the CDA and it's fully executed, and then we don't get a feasibility questionnaire until like a month later. And it's just like, you know, like that's a lot of time that was just kind of wasted. You know, just sitting on it. And then we fill out the feasibility questionnaire, and if we hear back from them, you know, what I mean, it's it's most of the time not for another three weeks, two weeks, two to three weeks. You know, mm-hmm. and so it's just a time consuming process. And so that's kind of where we're at is like, we filled out that one so far and we're waiting to hear back. And that was like two, two weeks ago, or I guess at this point, three weeks ago this week. So, and we'll see if we ever hear back. And, and yeah, like there's a lot of other ones, like we just filled out the CDA and we're going to fill out the feasibility this coming Monday, you know, and, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, initially, yeah, I was having a hard time with, you know, filling out a bunch of feasibilities and, you know, waiting never really hearing any response back and not getting awarded any studies, you know? <clears throat> and it's like you said, it's, it, it comes down to a lot of the times, like their perspective when uh, with like advertising, you know, like if you're going to rely on advertising and not like necessarily put some patients in your database, they, they're probably going to be less inclined to to want to award you that study. But, you know, I, I think really since we implemented, you know, those changes, like we have yet to see, and again, that's really on their on their end, you know, but we have yet to see if it's really changed anything on that behalf. But hopefully, you know, hopefully those things that we've changed are we get awarded like each study that we fill up feasibility for. But I'll let you know. I mean, you'll be the first okay. person I let know, right? So. Well, if I recall the numbers correctly, uh, you were filling out something like three a month and it had done 15 or so without it getting a study. Yeah, exactly. It was it was. Uh, yeah, and and again, I was just thinking like, like, wow, maybe this is just like hard to get studies. But like you said, in your guys' experience, you know, unless we're, and again, we're not in a competitive area. It's not like it's a, you know, a research site every block, you know, of in our city. Right. You know, it's like there's only a handful of sites here, and yeah, I was just like, I was wondering what what I was doing wrong, you know. And so like when we went through it and we kind of like looked at how we were filling it out, you know, we identified some areas where maybe that's going to be the problem area, right? And yeah, like I said, I'll let you know when, when we see what, if those were the issues, you know what I mean? Or I don't know. I can't imagine we're on some like hidden blacklist, you know? But, were, oh. Oh, oh, there we go. Am I there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, like I was saying, I can't imagine that we're on some like hidden back end blacklist. And, and no, you're, you're not. Know, you're not. Just, I doubt it, but you know, um, no, but yeah, it was like no, a lot of feasibility. Way too early for that. For you to exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just, just to confirm your, um, analysis of timelines in research literally this is a true story i filled out a feasibility one time and two it took two years for them to schedule the site selection visit wow two years later i was like what study is this sometimes like they to, plant seeds send, they sent an email yeah we'd yeah. like to schedule a site selection visit i'm like okay what study is this Man, i looked it up two years ago abraham have you reached out you're part of a private practice too. So have you reached out to like sales reps that come 
yeah we 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 have and and that has its own successes you know and you yeah. know even even today we have like a talk with an msl you know with uh with one of the one of one of you the bigger companies you haven't but no, no i have oh, okay okay no yeah but like today we have another one today oh but, today i got you yeah yeah but um that it's has planting seeds it's planting yeah that's seeds. more planting seeds because like I, again nothing's really paid off from talking to because like a lot of times with those site reps i'm like oh hey you know we we do clinical research studies and you know either the physician mentions it during their meeting or, or i'm there present and most of the time they're like oh yeah yeah we'll get you a contact and then whether or not they follow up you know with that contact it's sometimes we have to chase them you know yeah. like hey give us that lead give us that the msl contact and then when we finally talk to the msl they're like oh okay <laughs> you know you're doing studies that's great that's great we'll we'll get in touch with you and then you know we have yet to hear back you know so so right. like you said it's planting season eventually i'm sure it'll pay off and maybe there's gonna be a study that they're gonna be like yeah we need sites oh we have this site in el paso that could potentially do it but you know again to be seen you know so we'll, we'll have to see that it's planting seeds yeah we did the uh obesity studies we got one of them was from a msl yeah um and then the other one came because we were on shared investigator platform because they make you get yeah. on that yeah. so then they found us and then yesterday that sponsor's sales rep was actually there dr smith told me to talk to her i asked her for the msl she texted her on the spot the msl texted back here's my email chris i still have to send you that email for you um did she get back to you chris Mm-mm. i'll send you her email she's the msl and uh yeah it's just planting seeds like you said abraham yeah yeah and and i mean hopefully hope <clears throat> you know hopefully we'll uh see the the fruits of, of that labor you know come to fruition right but uh, another thing will. another thing we've been doing too is like with you know clinicaltrials.gov and, and again that has its own rewards and and you know risks to it too because like not all sponsors are the same right but we yeah we we kind of do our own back end you know business development and, and we're searching for you know sponsors that are actively recruiting or not yet recruiting on clinicaltrials.gov and we do that outreach and that's actually been how we've talked to a lot of sponsors and, and kind of get on their their list per se you know what i mean so um but you know that's that's just what that is at that point you know what i mean just kind of searching for sponsors but yeah the more databases you're in the more lists you're on the better yeah exactly i mean it doesn't hurt and so and it's definitely planting seeds because a lot of times this stuff is not immediate, right? It might yeah. be it might be years because especially with the MSLs, they're, they're gathering information about studies, A, that you can do and B, that you'd like to do, right? Yeah. And they're more interested in what you can do opposed to what you would like to do, right? Yeah. What, what can you get patients for? But they do take into consideration what you would like to do. Yeah. Um, and it might be two years until a study comes along that fits one of those two categories that they're doing or five years so yeah, exactly um i have spoke with an msl once in which they said we have a study now that would be a good fit for you guys and i'll try and get you guys some information oh, yeah. and get you in never came to be but yeah. it does happen right it, most yeah. likely the study because they don't know they're not directly in the research space yeah uh, it probably had all the sites it needed what, what happened it, to my camera yeah no, you're all blurring yeah, Dan, but yeah. Dan left and I'm blurry. Yeah, you're <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean it's exactly like it's uh I mean we'll we'll have to see when it when it kind of pans out. And and again, there's also like I've had a lot of studies, you know, come across too. Like I do get studies that but they're harder studies, you know what I mean? Or they're for like some specific indication that like we don't have the you know the capacity or facilities for, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. so there's a lot of opportunities that because there is a lot of opportunities, it's just there's never really that good fit you know until after a while you have to wait and sit and, and keep searching for it and when that good fit comes in it's going to be worth it like like i said with that first study we had it was at least from my perspective it was worth it you know it kind of got us off the ground you know and made sure. it something that we could actually do and and grow so 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 you're not you're not into forcing round pegs into square holes or vice versa no there's there's no reason for that because like and I and I always and I always say that it's just like it'll just be a bigger headache to to just you know say yes to everything and then just try to figure it out later. Like sometimes that'll work out, right? But 
at, le- at least with certain like studies, like it's not going to work out. You know, it's, it's just going to cause much more of a difficulties at the site level. And then when that good study does come along, our attention will be divided at that point. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so it, it just wouldn't be something that we could really dedicate time to and make, make it justifiable, you know, but good. <laughs> and I say that cause there, there is this one that like, <laughs> I was reading the the protocol for, and I was just like, wow, like, that's a tough one, you know, like, like first, where are you even going to find those patients? And, and second, like you need so many different team members to really make sure that it's safe for the patient. You know what I mean? And, and again, like to, to invest in that and maybe it works out, it's, it'll just be, it's just not really worth, worth it, you know? So. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are a lot of studies that require a lot of staff members. So you you need say six or more staff (laughs) members. And then additionally, you're lucky if you can get three patients for the study, oftentimes, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I can fully relate. Um, to those that are newer, though, if you can yeah. get those two or three patients, I would certainly try and do those Go studies. Yeah. Well, as Abraham's alluding to, it, it significantly improves your standing in the industry to get that experience. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Those are the types of studies that mostly new physicians are doing because sites don't want to deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> you mean I got to run a full house of employees and I'm at, at best, if I'm lucky, I can get three patients. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like um, it, it, it just makes it really hard. But like you said, like to a certain extent, you need experience, you know, move, going into the industry. Like that was one of our biggest challenges is like with our PI, you know, like he didn't have that prior research experience. So It wasn't only just finding a study that is actually feasible, but it's also finding something, a study that we can actually do to get that experience on, on paper and and show sponsors that, yeah, we are capable and we can run a study and we can enroll for it and, and we're reliable, you know what I mean? So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's one of the aspects, but, you know, even now, like um, with, with the rheumatologist that we have on board now, like they came with a wealth of experience, you know what I mean? Like it's, Mm -hmm. they have a lot of studies that they've contributed to and been a part of. And so that just kind of boasts all of us together. It's like, yeah, they have experience and now we can go ahead and do, you know, guarantee or not guarantee, but really over, he can oversee and we can go ahead and provide the services for this new study and enroll patients to an adequate amount. You know what I mean? Cause again, like sponsors always have their minimum enrollment expectations, you know? And so as long as we hit that number, you know, and hopefully go beyond it, um, that's what we're kind of going to be able to show them with this, you know, wealth of background research that they come with you know what i mean but um yeah that's that's the trickiest part is like especially starting out like it was it was hard getting that first study and and again it was it wasn't even like uh we filled out feasibility and it was like yeah here you go it was like filled out feasibility they're like mm, but you don't have experience and then we had to like tell them like yeah well we don't have research experience but the the pi he's treated this condition for many years you know what i mean he's he has practical experience as a physician so you know it, it'll translate to this study and thankfully they went for it and you know, it worked out. Good. So, um, I don't really have any other questions, but I would like to make a statement for everybody who's watching this video. Abraham will be in Oklahoma city next year in April. Sure. Yeah. He (laughs) said he guaranteed you'll be there. Ah, Oh, I'll be there. Are you driving this time too? Oh, no, no, thank you. (laughs) So, so if you want to say hi to Abraham, make sure come say hi to him. If you're watching this video, it's only a year from now. This is a rising star in the space i mean to have a site so young and already be successful at it like it's amazing um what's next for you like what do you think how do you want to expand or do you want to expand what what is it you want to do so so you know like i told you my background has been in, in academic research right and and so i always have that appreciation for the academic side of things but at least in the meantime for the clinical research you know aspect of everything I definitely want to, you know, broaden our partnerships and collaborations in the area to not only like just get more studies, but also to be that center that basically offers that innovation aspect and and kind of hope to patients. Because a lot of the patients that call and and ask about studies that we have going on, like you could kind of hear a certain, you know, desperation to them, like looking for new treatment options for their conditions, you know, And, and I actually had, you know, early on, I had one person call me looking like basically almost in tears like asking for studies and I was just like you know so on my end I I went ahead and researched it and looked at the closest one and the closest one is in Dallas so like 
significantly out of her area, you know what I mean? And and some patients just don't have the fee, the means to make that, you know, commute and and stick to it. So so at least moving forward, our hope is to not only like grow in terms of just offering more studies, but also collaborating with new physicians so we could target different disease indications and different, spe- you know, with different specialties and and just offer more options to patients. And apart from that, hopefully we can kind of tie our branch back into, you know, the academic side of research and also be a part of that discovery process and kind of contribute to, you know, the late, because again, clinical research is the late end of the research, right? But contribute to those early ends and, and make our impact that way as well, you know? So, so I actually lied. I have one more thing to say or ask. So Abraham, did you do much networking at the conference? I'm promoting our conference here too. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> did you do much networking there? Yeah, actually, that's, that's a funny thing you said. Somebody I, I met with, I just had a, a call with them yesterday. You know what I mean? Uh, basically sharing study leads and, and discussing like basically our, our shared problems, but also our shared plans and strategies so we could both be you know successful. And, and so, yeah, I, I met a lot of new friends, I would say, you know, like, awesome. um, so, so it, it was, it was great. Like I tell you, like, I haven't really jumped around to too many conferences, you know what I mean? But, sure. you know, from what I I've bet. heard, especially at the conf- your guys' conferences, like, it's not, that's not the norm, you know what I mean? Like, not many people can expect to just have that open dialogue with everybody else, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, sure, you know, if you, if you're really pushy, you can talk to people at other conferences, but at your guys, like at SOS, it was just like, you sit down and it's like, Hey, what's up? You know, what do you, in, like, what, what do you do? And it's like, Oh yeah, what do you do? And then boom, now we're friends, you know, like we add each yep. other on LinkedIn and now we have that contact, you know? So, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know whichever way you want to look at it, but at both the pre and post party, I was somewhat well lubricated. So I don't recall, did I introduce you to uh, David? La Haye? No, uh, Martinez. He's in, he's in Texas as well. Um, I, I can't recall if I did or not, but um, he got, he was able to get one or two studies from our conference. Um, really? He's a, yeah. He's yeah. a site as well. So there were sponsors make, there. Yeah. You got to make sure and talk with the sponsors when you go to our next conference, just FYI. Oh yeah. There sponsors, make, make there sure. were CROs. And, and hook up with maybe your friend or two that you made at the last conference. You guys could go together right yeah and, yeah well that's a plan everybody up. everybody i've talked to so like that was there plans on going to the next one so i mean that goes to show you like how everybody thought it was equally beneficial so yeah yeah we ain't yeah. going nowhere man we we with well, this sos is going to continue people like abraham are going to be there um we'll be networking more too i know you're a client of dscs but uh just as like individual side owners um and you, you were saying you were doing some community outreach recently this week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like uh, we, <laughs> so, so I, I saw your, you know, your video too. And I was just like thinking like, yeah, how, how can we get to patients without it being, a, you know, getting a, a rid of that barrier of them having to come to us, you know? Yeah. And so, so one thing I saw, and, and you had mentioned um, like nail salons, right? Like going to nail salons and, you know, that maybe went even viral like, guys, yeah. 100,000 views. Hundred thousand views on Instagram. What? Hundred yes. thousand views go to the nail salon to get a study? We made so let me break down what we do. No one's doing this. This is my idea. I take full ownership. Oh the marketing. Okay, I got it. Yeah. 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 How do we contact how do we get patients to know us without being obnoxious? Yeah. Hey, we do trials. I mean, they don't even know what that is. So Every month. Today, I'm doing another one with the plumbing company. Yeah. We interview a business owner in the town, preferably one I like, I'm a fan of, and or one of our staff, because it's not about me. Yeah. The nail salon was our staff. CRC was like, hey, did you know our neighbor is a nail salon um, owner? And she actually won Yuma's Best Nail Salon. We go, they get their nails done all the time after work. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, all right, well, I'll go interview her for the podcast then. Like, I don't need to do anything this month. Kick my feet up. So the two coordinators went. One of them was getting their nails done while the other one, they were all talking during the pod. Yeah. So it was like 30 minutes. Nothing about research. Just about yeah. the nails. Nail, what do you do? How do you like this? That got spliced up into like four shorts. One of the shorts 
one of the shorts which was like I think they asked her something about what was the longest set you've ever done. All right. That got a uh, hundred thousand views on Instagram. So wow. I'll just show a little bit of it here. I think the longest I've gone was maybe like five hours. Dang. Dude, five hours. What was that? I want to know what Detailed. kind of set that is. Yeah. Detailed. Yeah, I have one particular client. Uh, one per- yeah, one client in specific, but she gets like the detailed design. Every single time this girl does. What does she mean by the longest she went was five hours without getting her nails done? No, how long was the (laughs) longest client of hers? Yeah, I know. I don't understand this female talk either. (laughs) Point is, it doesn't matter what I think. The community voted with their eyeballs. Yeah. She's now referring patients to us. We're helping any patient that finishes our study that's uh, once their nails done, we send to her, we pay for it. If she herself was curious about studies for her family, it works. It This stuff works. Yeah. It's natural grassroots conversation. There's no immediate ROI. I didn't think that would go viral. <laughs> I would never expect that one to go yeah. viral. That's the one <laughs> yeah. that went viral. And we just keep at it. I mean, but that over time builds awareness. And so I think yeah. stuff like that, it works. Uh, that's been my theory, and now it's starting to turn into proof that it works. Yeah, yeah, and and, and again, like trying to take a take a you know a bit of your advice and, and and kind of play by that that playbook you've even set out is like I've been even reaching out to you know our community haircut salons, you know, like, uh, like that's dope. You should a get lot a of, haircut while you interview them. Yeah, have your that, other that, coordinator <laughs> tape you guys. And then just do like a 20 minute conversation. Exactly. Uh, see, like the fact that that's how you, you've approached it too, like gives me great, like way more ideas to how we can go ahead and, you know, involve the community in, in what we do. Cause again, like here research is also a little bit stigmatized for patients because a lot of, you know, at least in our, our Hispanic population, they don't, they don't really trust medicine, you know what I mean? And there's, I mean, not only is it a, a challenge to get them to go to regular doctor's appointments, you know what I mean? That for their health, but to also get them to participate in research that, you know, may or may not directly benefit them. You know what I mean? Like that's a challenge in itself. And so, yeah, like, you, like I said, like going to those haircuts, haircut salons and, and talking with the owners and yeah. talking to, and I mean, that's where a bunch of conversations happen. So, you a know, bunch. next month, hopefully it's batting cages. There's a new batting <laughs> cage, indoor batting cage in Yuma. So nice. me, a coordinator, which will be Katie. She likes baseball. And then the owner will be mic'd up and we'll be like swinging while talking about <laughs> baseball. Baseball, yeah. And guess what? We're going to splice them up. Hopefully one does really well. And if not, you still have the other day in Nato, one of our sponsors asked us for proof that we're doing community outreach. They actually asked for links to proof. <laughs> Everyone says they do. Okay, well, show us. Yeah. Here's four of the last podcasts we did. Here you go. They're all minority um, owned. You know, because they like the minority stuff. Yeah. This is what we do, and they're like, "Wow, no one's done that. This is um, this is really good." Yeah, exactly. I there mean, you go. It, it can only really help. You know, help you. You know, and at the end of the day, because you get good conversations out of it, you you show the community that you're there. You're a person too with them, and you're you're, you're no different. You're no you're not a scary you know research center or anything like yeah, that. And nothing. You know, and on top of all that, you can show sponsors and even like Anato, you know, some some vendors like we do community outreach and and this is our, because that's a part of our values. You know what I mean? Is mm-hmm. communicating with the community and involving them. So, so yeah, exactly. So that's what, that's kind of what we were doing is with the, the haircuts, haircut salons and, you know, Dang. again, minority owned local owned. So and that was, was cool. Like, you know, you can only really talk to cool people at that point, you know what I mean? Like get different perspectives that, you know, we don't see in, in just our fields of research, you know what I mean? So, so that was, that was fun. So that's what we were doing on, what was it? Uh, Tuesday? Yeah, Wednesday. Tuesday, because yeah. I wanted to do this podcast then, and you were like, no, nah, I'm doing community outreach, like like you <laughs> yeah. said. But Abraham, yeah. someone that's been following the blueprint, and you're just getting started, man. So thank you so much. Look, everybody go connect with Abraham. His LinkedIn's underneath. He's a satisfied DSCS client. He's an SOS enthusiast. 
He's a up and coming site owner. Chris, anything else you want to? Very add? nice guy. I very much like Abraham. Very nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't want to network with Abraham, especially after this pod? So connect with him on LinkedIn. It's in the show notes. It's under the video. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Bye bye. <laughs>